Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the RAC Art Talks. I'm Professor Jing Han, the Director of the Institute for Australian Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on our Parramatta South campus, which is on the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation, and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. And we would like to pay our respect to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm very excited about today's lecture on Shinwazari, a very interesting, highly specialized field. I will leave the excitement to my colleague, Sally Bowman, our senior project officer, who will introduce the speaker, Chris Trump, and chair today's session. Here you go, Sally. Thank you, Jing. I'm delighted to be hosting this fifth lecture in our seminar series, IAC Art Talks. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the custodians of the land that I'm on today, the Darug people of the Darug Nation. I recognize their enduring connection and contribution to the land, water, culture, and community that have existed for over 60,000 years and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today, we're thrilled to have Chris Chun as our speaker. I'm particularly thrilled as I've known Chris since 2010, and I've been a really passionate admirer of his work ever since. Chris Chun is one of Australia's leading textile designers, known for his work in contemporary shinwazari. It's a distinctly modern twist on traditional Chinese art, that combines vibrant color and pattern with his love of nature and the environment. His work draws inspiration from his Chinese and Australian heritage, um, often incorporating elements such as flowers and birds and featuring intricate patterns that create a sense of movement and energy. His paintings explore themes related to identity, memory, and cultural heritage, and he uses a variety of painting techniques to create his unique, distinctive style. Chris honed his craft in Europe, designing for well-respected textile design studios whose clients included, among others, Giorgio Armani, Missoni, Laura Ashley, and his multidisciplinary art and design studio specializes in product development, art licensing, and brand collaborations with select clients worldwide. Chris is also an acclaimed fine artist and creates originals and limited edition prints, as well as products ranging from ceramics, textiles, home decor, fashion interiors, and stationery, which have been featured in multiple international publications. Chris divides his time traveling between Asia and Australia and his most recent exhibition, Lucky Rabbit, a celebration of Chinese New Year, was held at the Museum of Chinese Australian History in Melbourne earlier this year. Today, Chris has prepared a wide array of fabulous slides for us to accompany his talk, The Secret History of Shinwazari. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker today, Chris Chung. Hi everybody. Hi from Chiang Mai. Thank you for the lovely welcome, Jing. And thank you, Sally, for the wonderful introduction and for inviting me to give today's lecture on a subject really dear to my heart, Shinwazari. So when researching this topic, it's got immensely fascinating and complex and than I had originally thought. And, you know, there's so many intricacies to this um, genre that Every time I looked up something new, it led me down a new rabbit hole. So it was actually quite a challenge for me to stick straight to my topic. So in today's talk, I'm just going to provide a brief overview on Chinwazari, its historical context, intentions, impact, and the power dynamics that play during that time. And also how Chinwazari relates to my own practice, both as a professional designer and as a textile artist. And I'll also share some anecdotes on how China was influenced by the West. So Shinawazu was very much a cultural exchange of ideas and communication. It wasn't just one-way traffic. And I also just want to note that I am not an expert on Shinawazu. This is just purely an interest-based um, topic for me. So um, I was very surprised and thrilled to be invited to talk today. So let's get started. 
So what is chinoiserie? The term chinoiserie is said to have entered French popular culture in Honoré de Balzac's 1836 novel, L'Entodition, to describe decor made in the Chinese style that emerged in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries. It originated in the 18th century during the European Rococo period and is derived from the French word chinois, which means Chinese. Chinoiserie was very much a reflection of this period of time. There was significant commerce happening between the East and the West with maritime trade routes established by the Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch and British. But it was also the age of enlightenment where the philosophers, scientists and economists were also inspired by foreign cultures and civilizations, and in particular by the Chinese. Sinologists also introduced Chinese philosophy, ethics, the legal system and aesthetics into the West. Trading and communication between the East and the West was still quite limited. There were only a handful of Europeans that could speak Chinese. So people relied on objects, artworks and trade to gain knowledge about distant cultures and as such these goods acted as emissaries, introducing into new cultures and fostering connections between distant corners of the globe. So chinoiserie is not Chinese. It's an entirely European invention, an idealised version of what they thought the East looked like. Chinoiserie was fueled by a fascination with the exotic and the mystique surrounding the East, which captured the imagination of European artists and craftsmen. It entailed not only the stylized interpretation of Chinese artistic and decorative motifs, but it also provided a glimpse as to what life was supposed to be like there, resulting in a visually distinct aesthetic. Different Asian cultures like Chinese, Japanese and Korean cultures were all rolled into one. The focus was often on the aesthetic appeal of Chinese motifs rather than a deep understanding or interpretation of their original symbolism. And Chinese symbols and motifs were sometimes used as decorative elements rather than imbued with their original cultural or spiritual meaning. So you can see on the right, this they thought that um, ostrich hunting was a daily Chinese pastime, which I thought was quite fun. So you'll usually find these common key elements in chinoiserie design. Mythical beasts like dragons and serpents, foo dogs, ginger jars, fantastical pagodas, fabulous birds, um, people dressed in Chinese attire, and also with furniture, lacquered wood, baked bamboo, and blue and white china. So Shinwazari influenced various art forms, such as paintings. This piece was created in China during the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1912. Reverse glass painting flourished during this period, kick-started by the emperor Kan Shi and continued by Yong Jin and Chen Long. By the early 19th century, when this work was created, Chinese craftsmen had perfected the art of reverse glass painting and were producing a great deal of work for export to Europe. Such paintings were highly sought after by the European elite who bought them to fill their grand country homes with colour and beauty. These also included mirror and watercolour paintings. Even though the romantic painters were already using watercolours, the traditional Chinese ink monochrome paintings introduced a more spontaneous and less rigid style of painting with brush. And it also introduced a new rendering of natural scenes corresponding to a new perception of nature itself. Chinoiserie in architecture, when the European taste for Chinese goods grew organically in Europe as traders brought them back, the tipping point in Chinoiserie's popularity was when King Louis XIV of France built the Trion de Porcelain, a five pavilion structure bedecked with blue and white tile work on the grounds of the Palais de Versailles in 1671. Ever the trendsetter, Louis' fondness for chinoiserie, which included Chinese-style fashion, quickly spread throughout European courts, becoming quite a popular design throughout the 18th century. Sadly, this trion was demolished in 1687 and was replaced by the more permanent Grand Trion. 
In garden design, chinoiserie influenced the creation of ornamental structures and foliage. The Chinese tea, tea house is a garden pavilion in Sosusi Park in Potsdam, Germany, that was commissioned by Frederick the Great to adorn his flower and vegetable garden near his summer palace. Those of you probably recognize that the etching on the right is being labeled Japanese rather than Chinese, so you can see how they merged everything into one. Chinese style pavilions, pagodas and bridges were incorporated into European gardens, adding an element of exoticism and whimsy. The architect who exerted the greatest influence on the development of Chinese architecture and gardening in Europe was Sir William Chambers. His publications and works are particularly interesting because he was one of the few Europeans who had actually visited China three times in the 1740s. And bear in mind that each return journey to China during that time took 12 months. In interiors for the Royal Pavilion, John Nash freely adapted Indian, Arab, medieval, Chinese and other traditions in a more exuberant style of chinoiserie. Talk about stratosp stratospheric flights of fancy. Um, has anyone been to the Royal Pavilion in Brighton? Apparently there are at least 180 serpents and dragons embedded in the textiles, fixtures and walls. Chinoiserie designs also influenced European furniture particularly in France and England. Cabinets, screens and commodes were decorated with Chinese-inspired motifs, such as bamboo, pagodas and fretwork. Lacquer techniques, mimicking Chinese lacquerware, were also employed to create a glossy and intricate finish. Chinoiserie designs were also seen in textiles, such as silk fabrics that were used for upholstery, curtains and clothing. Textiles usually featured Chinese motifs such as pagodas, dragons, and figures dressed in Chinese attire. Two areas where chinoiserie is perhaps best well known is wallpaper and ceramics. Wallpaper was a sign of status as almost every manor house had a room with chinoiserie wallpaper. It became very popular in the 18th century, often featuring scenes such as landscapes, exotic birds, and botanical elements such as cherry blossoms, flowers, and trees. These wallpapers were either hand-painted or printed with wood blocks. They must have appeared almost jewel-like in their vibrant composition of detail and colour, providing a delightful contrast to the more traditional damask and tapestries that were normally found in Grand European residences during this time. Chinese wallpapers arrived in England as part of the larger trade of Chinese artefacts that included things such as lacquer, porcelain, tea and silks that were imported by the East India Company, the British company that was formed to trade with East and Southeast Asia, India and China. Now, the curious thing about Chinese chinoiserie wallpapers is that the Chinese actually didn't use these highly, decorate, decorate, de highly decorative painted painters like papers like this in their homes. They preferred their wall coverings to be plain, usually in white, crimson or gold. It was Chinese practice though, to paste paper over windows and paint pictorial decorations, particularly in the trading ports of Canton and Macau. So it may be, but it may be that these were admired by European merchants, which encouraged, which encouraged the Chinese to produce similar decorations for export. I am intrigued to do a little bit more digging because I haven't found anything in my research so far on how Chinese wallpapers actually came to be about. Perhaps the greatest influence of chinoiserie around the world was with porcelain. Chinese porcelain was highly coveted by Europeans and attempts were made to imitate its, its style. During this time, porcelain was, the, porcelain was only produced in China. The secret ingredient kaolin and the process of high firing was unknown to the rest of the world. Porcelain was prized for its strength, translucence and its pure white colour. Porcelain was so, it was so associated with its origin that this expensive and important ceramics came to be known simply as China, fine china or chinaware. In the early 1600s, 
Europeans could only make ceramic items from brown clays. So when this delicate blue and white Chinese porcelain ware first began to be imported by the, by the Portuguese and Spanish, they caused a sensation. The cargoes were so valuable but that they were also known as white gold. In the 17th century, China began to create porcelain specifically intended for sale on the European market. Some of the earliest pieces of this export porcelain, known as crack ware, dates back to the late Ming Dynasty for the Guanxi period. The name crack ware is believed to have come from Portuguese merchant ships called caracs, a type of mastered sailing ship. A crack ware dish with its decoration is typically divided into another into a number of panels around the plate rim. Usually always decorated in underglazed blue and featured intricate blue and white patterns with Chinese landscapes, figures and floral motifs. Its arrival in China, its arrival in Europe sparked a fascination with Chinese aesthetics and really set the stage for the development of chinoiserie as a distinct European style. European makers, meanwhile, kept trying to recreate porcelain, but they couldn't quite replicate its white kaolin clay mixture. They usually covered their local brown earthenware with a white tin glaze, decorated with mainly blue designs, very often with Chinese-style motifs. From around 1620, the main centre of production was a town, of Del a town called Delft in the Netherlands. And it was this type of blue and white ware that became known as Delft ware wherever it was made. The first European made porcelain was invented by two German alchemists, Johann Friedrich Bodger and Walter von Schmierhaus in 1708. A local source of kale in clay was then discovered close to the German city of Meissen. And the first European hard paste porcelain which contained kale in clay and alabaster. August the Strong, who was obsessed with porcelain, established the first European porcelain manufactory in 1710, known as Meissen. So I just want to talk about how chinoiserie has influenced um, my work, especially with porcelain. I mean, I just find the influence of porcelain around the world just incredible because, you know, you think, you know, Japan has their Arita wear, the Dutch have their Delft wear, the English have their willow. I mean, its impact was quite profound, even to, um, you know, the East where it's still big in Islamic culture and Persian, and Persian cultures. So there really is a reason why China is known as China. So this, um, thinking about this, it actually inspired my current series of paintings called Into the Blue, thinking about how all these, um, how this white gold was transported around the world by these old sailing ships. And so inevitably, inevitably there were lots and lots of shipwrecks. And, you know, I've, I've often wondered what would happen if by some mysterious alchemy, the treasures of the sea merged with the treasures from above. So I've just got this little, this little video to show you a little bit about my process of the creativity. So this is the Intrepid Explorer, the Delft Brothers inspired seahorses, Professor Peony. I have to admit this is partly inspired by the net, well, after watching Netflix, the, the octopus teacher as well, um, and then a lobster with the Mari decorations. Willow China, China Wear, is perhaps one of the most famous examples of chinoiserie. The willow pattern is a distinctive and widely recognised blue and white design 
that originated in England in the late 18th century. It depicts a romanticized Chinese landscape featuring a willow tree, a bridge, pagodas, birds, and figures in Chinese attire. The pattern's popularity was so enduring that, the sto that stories were being invented to explain the scene. The most popular is a haunting tale about two ill-fated lovers trans transformed into lovebirds that fly away. The popularity of the willow palette pattern soared, in the 19th, soared into the 19th century and continues now into the 20th, 21st century. It's become an iconic example of chinoiserie in Western ceramics, representing the European interpretation and appreciation of Chinese art and culture. The most popular willow pattern was designed originally by either Minton or Hosea Spode in the 1790s. It drew on motifs found all uh, drew on the motifs found across all manner of, all, of imported items from China. Chinoiserie reached its peak in the mid 18th century and became a prominent trend in European decorative arts, including furniture, porcelain, textiles, and wallpapers. Chinoiserie inspired interiors were fashionable among, amongst the European elite, showcasing a blend of Eastern and European styles. Chinoiserie was created in all parts of Europe during the 18th century, and it was especially popular in Russia, Denmark, Sweden, Holland, Germany, Great Britain, and France. Chinoiserie continued to be influential, applied to a lesser extent during the 19th century. Chinoiserie fell out of vogue in part due to the First Opium War between China and Britain, and in part due to the rise of other exotic aesthetics, such as Japonoir, the European Revival, and Moorish Revival. Chinoiserie evolved and incorporated new artistic movements, such as Romanticism and Orientalism, and still even to this day. But this exchange or influence was not only just one way. During the 16th to 18th centuries, the Chinese Qing Dynasty, during the Guangxi, Yongjin, Tianlong Emperor's reigns, the Chinese commissioned Western-style art and products exclusively for the Chinese market. These commissions were often initiated by the Chinese court and were intended to incorporate Western artistic techniques and styles into traditional art forms. While the, Man while the Manchus embraced Han Chinese cultural traditions as a cornerstone of their rule, they also welcomed artists, scholars and missionaries from all around the world who shaped the arts and architecture of China's, China's last dynasty. The Qing court employed European Jesuit painters, such as Giuseppe Castiglione, to create Western-style paintings that merged European realism with Chinese subjects and techniques. Also known by his Chinese name, Lang Xining, he painted this image in the Chinese medium of ink and colour on silk but with the volume and spatial sensibilities associated with Chinese, with European art. Castiglione had come to China as a Jesuit missionary and was employed as a court painter at the Imperial Court of the Three Emperors. Castiglione spent 51 years as a court painter, painting various subjects and died in 1766. His official rank was administrator of Imperial Parks, and he was posthumously promoted to Vice Minister. Marco Musilio wrote in the Xining Inheritance, Italian painters at Qing Court, that his lasting legacy was to integrate, fuse and translate European and Chinese techniques and elements to create a distinctive high Qing Court style. The Chinese court also developed, also had a fascination with Western mechanical clocks and timepieces. They commissioned European clock makers to produce intricate and ornate clocks that combined Western clockwork mecha mechanisms with Chinese decorative motifs and materials. These timepieces were exclusive to the Chinese court and symbolised the blending of Western technology and Chinese craftsmanship. Xinhuaserie today. Chinoiserie remains very relevant in the present day, 
Its influence can be seen in interior design, fashion and other artistic fields as designers and artists continue to draw inspiration from Chinese art and culture. This is Dagorne, a UK company which produces hand-painted wallpaper and fabrics. Tebo is a US furnishing fabric company which does a lot of chinoiserie prints. My friend Harrison Howard from America does these exquisite and charming chinoiserie scenes, very fantastical and colourful. And Patek Philippe, sometimes there's these custom commission clocks. So you're looking at one of these clocks is um, the most expensive in the world. And the influence of Shinimazuri also continues in Australia with my own take on the 500-year-old tradition. So introducing the art of Chanwazuri. So I'll take you through some of my Chanwazuri, introduce you to Chanwazuri. The Chinese zodiac, each... Zodiac animal has been created to bring abundance, joy, and prosperity to their owners. My Riches of Nature collection, taking photos of antique embroideries found in opera costumes and giving them a new lease of life. Habitat and wildlife, raising awareness for the environment and endangered species, focusing on Asia, on Asia and the subcontinent. And the beauty of orchids painting a new style of ink painting that's colourful, fresh and spontaneous. So I just thought that I would um, give my conclusion on the topic of chinoiserie. I think chinoiserie, despite its complexities, often emerged from a genuine appreciation and fascination with Chinese culture. It was a way for European artists to celebrate and explore the aesthetic and cultural richness of China. For me, the most important thing about Chinoiserie is that it opened up dialogue between the East and the West. It was about communication and connection. We can't rewrite history, but we can acknowledge Chinoiserie as openly as, pos as openly as possible and to make sure that there is a lot more that can be done that promotes culture with sensitivity. And I also think it's very important that you know, every, every one of us understands their own history and where they came from. I think to classify chinoiserie as just a form of cultural appropriation is being too simplistic because the Chinese actively sought trade with the West and were happy to produce goods for them, even if they knew it wasn't an accurate representation of their life. So by understanding these, this historical context and embracing the potential for genuine di dialogue, we can foster mutual appreciation and celebrate the creative interplay between cultures that Chimwazri represents. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. That was um, so interesting and enlightening and really wonderful to see such an amazing array of, of, of paintings and pictures to illustrate your talk. But um, Chris, what I've been thinking is I'd really love to hear from you. Um, you know, what was your aha moment, maybe your epiphany, you know, when you suddenly thought to yourself, you know, yeah, I really, I'm really fascinated by this subject, shimwazari. I want to follow it. I want this to become the base of my artistic practice. You know, what was that moment that, that caused you to follow this path? I don't know if there was one particular moment, but I think it was like sort of building blocks. I think, you know, I grew up in the 70s in Australia and, you know, we had wallpaper, we had, we had wallpaper, we had shimwazari you know, fabric on the sofa and, you know, bamboo gilded mirrors. And so I think, you know, that was, that was, I guess, my first visual introduction to, you know, to Chinese culture. I mean, apart from being, you know, Australian born Chinese or whatever, but I think, um, you know, and I think also being a textile designer where, where, you know, we're, we're um, exposed to, and you know, designing so many patterns. And I think, you know, Shinomasa really just, came natural to me because I love painting nature. It's very important to me. You know, I love birds and flowers. And I think being being Australian born Chinese, having that Chinese heritage, but also um, I think being Australian, having that wanderlust because we are so far away from the world. And, you know, we do have that, that sense of wanderlust and wanting to, you know, discover and explore new things. And also, you know, doing things in a different way because, 
you know, Australia is very, relatively young compared to the rest of the world. So, you know, we don't, we're not really so bound by, by set rules, I think. And I think, you know, the fact that I, you know, sort of honour my heritage and, you know, try and bring to like the more traditional Chinese symbolism elements. And, mm. you know, I like to see my work as a way of sort of educating people as well at the same time, but in a fun and, um, you know, distinct manner. That's great. That's fabulous. I think Jing's got a question. Yes, I, I, I found this talk is fascinating. There are so many aspects to it, including you know, uh, current discussion about uh, appropriateness. So that's fascinating. But back to uh, when you said um, the the chinoiserie actually was European invention. And, and then it is their fascination and imagination of what, you know, Chinese style would be like. I'm quite fascinated by their fascination. So my question is, how much you think back then in 18th century, this uh, style established based on uh, reality because of the many of them actually visited China, as you mentioned, some actually for a long term, 12 months-ish. So how much was it based on what they actually sing and how much was it based on pure imagination? Well, I think it was mainly based on on the on the goods they bought back on the on the cargo ship so you know so whatever was bought back um you know on the ships that would form their bases then whatever whatever else they didn't though they just made up that you know the rococo painters just made up in their that made up in their heads really so i mean i mean ostrich hunting and you know sit, sitting on um dragons i mean it's very it's very fantastical isn't it really but i mean you can imagine if you're, you know, during that time, I mean, it would have been, I mean, I just don't know what the, what the equivalent would be now, but, you know, to sing something that's so amazing for the first time. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it's the, um, I don't know, the internet now, but I, I mean, I'm trying to think something visually that was like, that's like, oh my God, you know. The one thing I found quite interesting about your art, uh, Chris, is, um, Obviously, chinoiserie is a very traditional and ancient technique in many ways. But your work is like to look so contemporary. I mean, look, they are so contemporary. So how do you manage that, you know, using an old technique to bring out actually contemporary uh, style? Um, well, I think it's just, I think it's my, I think it's my approach to things. I, li I like to... I like to honor the past, but I like to give it a new lease of life and um, perspective, you know, you know, for now. And, you know, I think when I paint, I want to bring, um, you know, joy and, and, and give people something to think about. I mean, it's not, it's not so much, um, I'm not trying to make a political statement or anything. It's just, um, you know, delighting the viewer and, you know, just, just, and honouring my heritage and also my unique upbringing in Australia because we do, as I mentioned, you know, as Australians, we do have this, we do have this openness and, um, you know, wanderlust for travel and new ideas and we're not, we're not really scared of trying new things and I think, I think that that comes across in my artwork and plus I think because, we do have this unique light in Australia as well. It does affect our colours and make it a lot different to um, the rest of the world. I think our time has come to an end, sadly. Um, but uh, Jing and I and the Institute would really like to thank you for all the time you've put into preparing such an entertaining, interesting talk. And we wish you well for your next project. And we're looking forward to seeing you in Sydney when you're, you have your exhibition. Hopefully yeah. next year. Thanks so much, Sally. Thanks, Jing. And thanks, Lindsay, for the backhand. You guys have been great. Thank you, Chris.